Hi, welcome to the Harry Smith Employment Podcast. I'm Charlotte Farrell and I'm joined today by Jane Middlecombe. And for today's podcast, we're taking a sidestep into immigration law. We're going to be looking at the issues around employing overseas nationals to work in the UK. This can seem like a really daunting process for some, but it's been brought into sharp focus by Brexit and the end of free movement. And it's something we're receiving more and more inquiries about as the weeks go by. Today, we're going to look at skilled worker visas and the need for companies to obtain a sponsor license to sponsor skilled workers in the UK. We're also going to take a look at the new global business mobility routes recently introduced by the government and the sponsor duties that businesses have to comply with if they choose to go down any of these routes. So Jane, what are the key things that UK employers need to know about if they're thinking about employing overseas nationals to work in the UK on skilled worker visas? Well, Charlotte, the first thing you need to consider is whether the overseas national is um, actually eligible for a skilled worker visa. And the skilled worker visa is the um, new name for the tier two visa. So there are two main requirements. Firstly, the job role that the overseas national is going to be doing in the UK needs to be at the right skill level. So in order to be eligible for a skilled worker visa, the job role must be within one of the eligible job classification codes called SOC codes. These include CEOs, managers and directors in various industries, uh, HR, engineer, IT professionals, healthcare professionals, teachers, professional services such as accountants and those in skilled trades such as bakers, electricians, plumbers, mechanics. There's a really long list of eligible roles. But once you've identified the correct SOC code for the role you wish to fill, you then need to establish the minimum salary that needs to be paid for the role. And the minimum salary level for a skilled worker visa is £25,600 per annum. However, each SOC code has its own going rate of salary, which must be paid if that's higher than that minimum level. So, for example, the going rate for a CEO role is £67,300 per annum. The minimum salary threshold can also be reduced if the individual is going to be employed in a shortage occupation, has a PhD in a subject relevant for the role, or if they're a new entrant, for example, if they're under 26 years old. So once the company has established that the job role is at the correct skill level and salary level, and someone can be sponsored to work in the UK in that role, uh, what should the company do next, Charlotte? Well, to be able to sponsor someone to come to the UK to work on a skilled work visa, the company's going to need to apply for a sponsor licence. As I said earlier, this has been brought into sharp focus by Brexit because employers new, now need a sponsor licence to employ EU nationals to come to the UK, as well as, as those who work from outside the EU, which is what's always been the case. Um, so with the end of free movement, many more companies are happy to apply for a sponsor licence to recruit the talent they need for their businesses. It's an online application process, um, but the company do need to send in official supporting documents with the application. And I think this is really specific about the types of documents that they have to send, and they can reject applications if the rules aren't followed. The rules do often change as well, so it's something that, that has to be kept on top of. The application also needs to be supported by a covering letter. And again, the Home Office sets out what that letter must include. Um, for example, most businesses will need to send a higher part of the business, which sets out details of the roles that the company intends to sponsor. And there are also additional requirements for certain types of businesses as well, such as startups and franchises. And again, that's all set out in the immigration rules and has to be followed. It's vital to get the sponsor license application right because if the application is refused, then there's no right to appeal and the business can't apply again for six months, by which time the person that, that they may have wanted to bring to the UK may have found an alternative role, people's circumstances may have changed over the six months of the process as well. It normally takes eight weeks to obtain a sponsor license, depending upon the home office's um, capacity at the time, and the license is valid for four years. It costs either £536 or £1,476, depending upon the size of the company. So, Jane, do you want to share a bit more information about the duties that a sponsor has and the responsibilities attached to being a sponsor? Yes, Charlotte. Well, the application is really just the start of the process. And being a sponsor is not just about getting the licence and then forgetting all about it. Sponsors have ongoing duties and responsibilities. Uh, a sponsor is subject to a wide-ranging list of sponsor duties, including record-keeping and reporting duties. And non-compliance with these duties risks the sponsor licence being revoked, meaning that they would no longer be able to sponsor migrants in the UK. 
You can also be subject to unannounced compliance visits from the Home Office either before or after the sponsor license is granted. So it's really important that companies get all their ducks in a row before the application is made. This includes making sure that they have the appropriate HR systems in place, for example, to monitor the right to work, keep relevant documents, track attendance, keep contact details up to date and report to the Home Office if there is an issue. Sponsors are also given access to the online sponsorship management system, which is how they manage their license, report any changes and apply for certificates of sponsorship for the overseas nationals they wish to employ. That's really interesting, Jane. It's something that I expect a lot of businesses aren't really prepared for when they, they consider bringing people to the UK to work. The Home Office um, say that sponsors are the first line of, of immigration defence and they, they really do need employers to take their obligations seriously and that's obviously shown in the, the rules they set out. Can you give us a bit more information about the practical steps that a company needs to take once it has its sponsor licence in order to bring someone to work in the UK as an individual? Yes. So like you say, the Home Office really relies on sponsors to take their sponsor duties seriously. And once the company has a sponsor license, it needs to apply for and assign a certificate of sponsorship to the uh, potential employee. So the certificate of sponsorship or a COS is actually only a reference number that the individual puts on their online skills worker visa application to prove that they have an eligible job offer from a UK employer. In addition, the individual needs to prove their English language skills. So this can be done in a variety of ways, such as having a degree taught in English or passing an approved English language test at an approved test centre. Uh, the good news for applicants from an English speaking com a country is that they will be exempt from the English language requirement. Skilled workers can also bring their partner and children with them to the UK and their visa can last up to five years and can be extended as many times as they want, as long as they still meet the eligibility requirements. And then after five years in the UK on a skilled worker visa, the employee may be able to apply for indefinitely to remain or settlement, giving them the right to live and work in the UK permanently. So although the skilled worker visa is probably the most common work visa, there are other routes that companies can use to employ overseas nationals in the UK, aren't there, Charlotte? Yes, there have always been several different options depending upon someone's personal situation. And the government has also recently announced several new sponsored immigration routes. For example, the Global Business Mobility Visa became available on the 11th of April this year. This is for overseas businesses who want to establish a presence in or transfer staff to the UK for specific business purposes. It encompasses five different routes, which replace four routes that existed before and also creates a new route. The existing routes, which have been renamed and tweaked a bit, um, are predominantly the senior or specialist worker visa, which is for senior managers or specialists who are employed overseas and who are being sent to a linked UK business. This used to be called the intracompany transfer visa, which many people were familiar with. The second of the four um, replacement routes is the graduate training visa, which is for employees of an overseas business who are on a graduate training programme, which will lead to a senior management or a specialist position and who are required to do a work placement with a linked UK business. There's also the UK Expansion Worker Visa. This visa is for senior managers or specialist employees, again, of an overseas business, who are being assigned to the UK to establish a UK branch or subsidiary of that overseas business, so to set up a presence here. And there's also the Service Supplier Visa, which is for contractual service suppliers who are employed by an overseas business, or also for self-employed independent professionals who are based overseas, who are being assigned to the UK to Right services covered by one of the UK's international trade agreements. So that's quite a specific route, um, that one. The new route created recently as part of the Global Business Mobility Visa is the secondment worker visa. This is for employees of an overseas business who've been seconded to the UK as part of a high value contract or investment. It's unlikely to be used much though, as the investment or contract has to be worth at least £10 million pounds a year and no less than £50 million pounds in total. So it's going to be a very narrow of businesses who can use that one. Each of these routes has different eligibility requirements, which is a bit of a theme of the sponsor system in the UK, and different maximum periods of stay as well. However, all of them require the UK employer to have a sponsor license. 
Controversially, none of the global business mobility groups will need to set up in the UK for the individual. This means they won't be able to work for five years in the UK on this visa and then automatically apply to stay here indefinitely. This could make these groups less attractive to individuals, especially if they have an option for, for another type of visa to come to the UK. But the global business mobility routes aren't the only new routes, are they, Jane? What other new routes are there that people can consider? Yes, so in addition to the global business mobility routes, um, another sponsored route being introduced from the 22nd of August this year is the Scale-Up Visa. And that's intended for talented individuals who have the skills required to enable uh, the sponsoring Scale-Up business to continue growing. Interestingly, those on the Scale-Up Visa will only have to spend the first six months of uh, their time in the UK working for their sponsor. And after that, they can undertake work for any UK employer. That's really interesting and very different uh, to most of the other routes and, and options available. I also understand there is a new route, though, that doesn't require sponsorship at all. Is that true? Yes, it is. So the government has introduced a new route available from the 30th of May um, that won't require a UK sponsor. So the high potential individual visa is a route for individuals who have a degree from a top global university awarded in the last five years. Um, however, this visa is only going to be lasting for two or three years and, again, will not automatically lead directly to settlements. Thanks, Jane. That sounds really interesting and, and it's just a different uh, to previous arrangement. So many of these new immigration needs are going to be welcomed by employers, but it's not yet clear whether they really go far enough to enable UK businesses to employ the talent that they require. It's going to be interesting to see how many people take up these new rates over the coming months and years and the effects that has on, on businesses as well as those individuals. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you found it useful. For further information in relation to the issues we've discussed today or to discuss any immigration queries you may have, please do contact us via our website, which is www.parisfederal.com. Thank you for listening.